Now, a somewhat curious encounter. Zlavoj Zizek, professor in the Institute for Sociology at Ljubljana in Slovenia and at Birkbeck College in London, is one of the more unusual philosophers of our day, an old-fashioned Marxist, student of psychoanalysis and star of a movie called The Pervert's Guide to Cinema. He was in Melbourne for Parallel the 2009 National Architecture Conference, where he joined us to talk about how the gaps between different viewpoints have inspired intellectual practice. And this is what happened. Thanks very much. I'm honoured to be here. (laughs) You modestly disclaim any knowledge of architecture, though you do say my knowledge of architecture is constrained to a couple of idiosyncratic data. My love for Ayn Rand and her architectural novel, The Fountainhead, and uh, my admiration of the Stalinist wedding cake, Baroque Kitsch. Well, we might come back later to Stalinist architecture and Baroque Kitsch, but why The Fountainhead? head. Ayn Rand is an interesting phenomenon. She belongs to the series, let us say, like in French, Catholicism, Blaise Pascal, in early German literature, Heinrich Kleist, then later Brecht, people who are what I call over-Orthodox. They are absolute conformists in the sense that they spell out the secret premises of the ruling ideology in such clear, radical way that it's unacceptable and embarrassment for the ruling ideology itself. Ayn Rand's idea is enlightened egotism, no compassion for others, like pure individualist, brutal capitalism. So while she tries to formulate the very hard core of liberal capitalist ideology, she does it in such a way that she's an embarrassment. She's very popular. Her books are, I think, second after the Bible and Margaret Mitchell Gone with the Wind on the list of eternal bestsellers. But nobody publicly refers to her, although her influence is crucial. The big secret master of the last 20 years of United States prosperity, Alan Greenspan. Do people know that he was a card-carrying so-called objectivist, pupil of Ayn Rand? That's what I like. Again, people who do not try to subvert the official ideology, but follow it so faithfully that they are an embarrassment for it. (laughs) The conference is about parallax. Now, parallax is a key concept for you. What do you mean by parallax and why does it matter? What I mean by parallax is not only what it's the literal, usual meaning of the term, which is you observe an object, you see a change, but that change is not really a change in the object, but just a change in how you relate to the object in your perspective of the object. I think that one should add another twist and transpose this shift, which may appear to be just a shift in your perception, into reality itself. What interests me is objects which are in themselves inconsistent. Once they appear in this way, then they appear in another way. But there is no ultimate truth. The objects are the materialization of this inconsistency. But what interests me, and that's why I'm here, is how this works, especially in today's so-called postmodern architecture. Buildings which are privately owned but pretend to enact some kind of open public space and so on and so on. You find this displacement, don't you, in the work of modern architects like Daniel Liebeskind and Frank Gehry? Yeah, because I think that what fascinated me in some of their buildings is how sometimes they literally look as the spatial materialization of parallax. Often, especially, for example, in Liebeskind, the building looks as if it doesn't follow a consistent plan. It is as if it tries to materialize two conflicting, inconsistent architectural visions. What social or ideological tensions, antagonisms does this paralactic architecture materialize? I think the answer is clear. We live at a time where, of course, these times are formally democratic, open space, politically correct, tolerance for everyone, no exclusions, and so on. So we have a public space, 
But then this public space itself is secretly or not so secretly privatized again. And I think this basically, to put it in very simplified terms, accounts for all these tensions of our, they are so popular, they are, I think, emblematic of today's architecture. All these public performance arts venues, which is very popular to say today, they shouldn't be elitist, they should be open space where you don't have just boring elitist art, you have also shops, cafeterias, and so on and so on. But I think this is false openness. What would the the architects of these spaces need to be doing in order not to engage in this activity of presenting a false openness to the public? Or are they inevitably compromised just by taking on the commission? Well, many or even most of the architects are doing their honest job. I mean, one shouldn't put the blame on them because this kind of antagonism where We have public space which is privatized. This is our social constellation today. You cannot put the blame on the architects for doing this. If anything, what is interesting in great architecture is how they register this tension and how they nonetheless, in a utopian sometimes way, how they try to formulate some possible spaces of authentic freedom within this space controlled by corporations. So again, often we tend to blame the architects for the evils which originate elsewhere. And this maybe brings us back to your question of uh, Stalinism. (laughs) I mean, no way (laughs) pro-Stalinist, on the contrary. What fascinated me in Stalinism, here it's, I think, architecture at its best. It's how, let's take this wedding cake, Stalinist kitsch baroque. Our first spontaneous and totally correct association, I think, is, my God, but isn't this some kind of quasi-medieval, gothic, oppressive, hierarchical, self-enclosed, static architecture, as such reflecting this type of society. True, but to put it in very simplistic, but nonetheless, I think, correct terms. Isn't this the fundamental paradox of Stalinist architecture? We have a society, Stalinist communism, which officially presented itself as, you know, egalitarian, justice, the working class in power, and so on and so on. Then you look at the building, and what you see immediately there is some oppressive, quasi-medieval, hierarchic image. Architecture tells the truth. What was not allowed to state publicly was materialized in stones there. That's for me so interesting in architecture. It's often, how should I put it, a spontaneous critique of the ruling ideology. But how does the ruling ideology figure in the big performance space centers of modern architecture that you're talking about? I mean, if I say we're going to have a public performance space, we're going to have an artistic venue, and it shouldn't be elitist, it should be open to all, what reality is the architect concealing in building such a space? First, I think the anti-elitism of this art performance venues is a false anti-elitism. You have this incredible patronizing attitude of ordinary people are too stupid, you cannot just give them an opera. Look, let's be frank, what ordinary poor people who appreciate art And there are many, don't underestimate them. They don't have the money to stay in those cafeterias or to buy books or clothes in the boutiques which are attached to the performance arts venue. No, they just economize somehow, buy the ticket and go directly for the opera. So all those places which are supposed to give the anti-elitist flair are, I think, precisely what is elitist about this building. And I think... The only true openness is the elitist, aristocratic openness. I'm for a democratic elitism. Well, democratic elitism is our second name here on By Design. Uh, Slavoj Žižek, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And I'm grateful to you. I like this country. In spite of all your deviations, to put it in my <laughs> Stalinist term, you are a, the first country, if I was correctly informed with the Labour government, no? Yes. Point two, you are the country of 
one of my heroes who was governor here. You know the story, of course, of the mun- mutiny on Bounty. Yes, uh, but Bly. But an old advocate of Captain Bly. So he am I. A it's, it's a, it's uh, a big Fletcher pleasure. Christian Fletcher was a corrupted aristocrat who made a pact with criminals to throw over <laughs> this good egalitarian captain. The truth, as you probably know, is that later, when he was governor of however it's what called at that time Australia. New South he Wales, ma- yes. Yes, South Wales. You probably know that he enacted a very good policy towards ex-prisoners and so on, and he was too open for the local military elite. Uh, he's one of my heroes too. Oh my God, um. at least you see, we philosophers <laughs> know that uh, a, a military strong leader is not necessarily a wrong thing. Okay, Slavoj Žižek, thank you very much indeed and for I joining thank us. You. Thank you. I love this detail that we discovered. <laughs> My God, what is this? I think the, the, the Australian government should, should pass some law, you know, the way you have in some countries you shouldn't make fun of God or of great national <laughs> hero, no? To protect the image and, and name of Captain Bly against, against all these calumnies and so on, no? It is true what I say, that to simplify it, Christian Fletcher was a, you know, the typical structure in British Navy at that point was that the second and third captain were usually from corrupted noble families. Yes. Yes. And he was this, and he made the pact with the criminal elements. Ex-convicts among the population, they are throwing us out here, I think. Okay, okay. See, fascists, the ruling class doesn't want to hear this message. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thanks indeed. very much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. bye-bye. bye-bye.